Hey everyone, welcome to this video all about managed identities. Gonna dive into why we have them and how to use them. As always, if this is useful, please give this a like, subscribe, comment and share and hit that bell icon to get notified of new content. So let's think about why we want this managed identity in the first place. We can take a step back. I can think about the big Azure cloud. So I've got Azure. And obviously in Azure, we can have many types of resource. But for right now, I'm not gonna worry about the exact type of resource, just that I have a resource. So I have some resource running in Azure. This could be a virtual machine, it could be a serverless function, a web app, doesn't really matter. And the point is, inside that particular resource, I have an application. So I have some app running. And that application wants to be able to access other types of resource. I can think about, well, there's another resource over here that I want to access. Now remember, those resources have their own sets of role-based access control that configures, well, what different security principles can do, what rights do they have? Can they read? Can they update certain types of actions? So that's all defined in there. And so to use that, what do we need? Well, that application has to have some identity. It has to have been authenticated to be able to present an identity to actually get permission to something. And there are different ways to achieve this, but our ultimate goal when I think about managed identity, I wanna get rid of the pain about storing a secret, storing a certificate, managing the life cycle, rotating, rolling, any of that. And even when I think about Azure Key Vault, which is fantastic for storing secrets and certificates, I still have to initially authenticate to the Key Vault to get permission to access that secret. So it's not really a solution to my initial problem. I get that chicken and egg problem. So how did we solve this? Well, the traditional approach is I have a service principle. I can think about, I have my Azure Active Directory. So we have Azure AD over here. And the way we would do this is I would create an application registration. So in my Azure AD, I would say, okay, I'm gonna have this new app. And I would have this app one registration. Now, when I create an application registration, I can say, is it single tenant or multi-tenant? In fact, if we jump over really quickly, if I go and look, I can see my app registrations. When I do a new app registration, it asks me straight away, hey, who is gonna use this? Is it only my directory? Is it multi-tenant? Is it multi-tenant and Microsoft accounts? And I have all those different options available to me. But I create an app registration. In my case, we're gonna focus on this RBAC test app registration. I can go and create that app registration. And what that also does is the app registration is this global application ID. But then within my tenant, what it also is gonna do is for that app registration, it's gonna create a service principle. So the service principle is a representation of an app instance, just happens to be in the same tenant as that app registration itself. And we can see these. So if I jump over and look at some code for a second, I'm gonna use Microsoft Graph. So I've already installed the Microsoft Graph various modules. We have to connect to the Microsoft Graph. Now we have to tell it a scope. I wanna be able to access applications. So I'll pass it the application.read all scope. I've already connected. I'm then gonna select the beta profile, gives me access to a few extra things. I can see my context. Now the only thing I really care about here is my tenant ID because when we look at the app registration, we'll see it's in my home tenant. I can also look at the various scopes I have enabled. 
and one of those core ones that I requested specifically was that application.readall. This is really just some background information. Now what I want to do is I'm gonna go ahead and look at that application. So here we can see that RBAC test app registration, that is the app registration I've made, and I can see that ID over here, and notice the sign-in audience is just Azure AD My Organization, so it's just scoped for my tenant. But there's also a service principle was created with the same name as the app registration. So what I'm now gonna do is search for a service principle named RBAC Test App Registration. And if we look at this service principle, we can see sure enough, I have it. So I have a service principle and the app owner organization ID over here, remember is that BA211, well that was my tenant ID. So that's mapped to my local organization. So what we have right here is an app registration. So I wanted some account that I could use for my application. So we did an app registration that also creates a service principle, which is just the instantiation of the app in my tenant. So that now exists. Now when you go and add an enterprise app, it's really doing the same thing. So if I think about enterprise applications, there's many different types of enterprise app I can add, but very commonly we'll add one from the catalog. And that's just an application. Remember, the application is globally unique that some other tenant has enabled for multi-tenant use. You can see I've got Hulu and Netflix. I have Microsoft Teams in here. I have all these different applications. So when I think about what is an enterprise application, again, it generates a service principle. But this time I can think, well, actually, there was another, someone else's Azure AD tenant over here. So this is my... Azure AD tenant, this is someone else's. And what they did in theirs, they created an app registration for their app. It would have also created a service principle in their home tenant. But now if I add that application to my Azure AD, I wanna light it up. What it's gonna do is create a service principle in my Azure AD that represents that globally unique identifier. And once again, we can see these. So if we went and looked at the code again, and this is again, just some fun background, I can dump out all of the service principles. And this time I'm gonna search for Netflix or Microsoft Teams because I've enabled those in my organization. And once again, what you're gonna see is, hey look, there's a service principle for both of those. We can see the display names, we can see the IDs, we can see the app IDs, but notice the app owner organization IDs are different because the app is actually defined in someone else's Azure AD. But it creates a service principle in my Azure AD to represent that particular application. So this all makes sense. So this is the idea of, okay, great. I can create a service principle. And the point of once I have the service principle is how does my app use that service principle? How does it authenticate as it? So I have the service principle and I can add basically ways to authenticate with it. I could add something like a secret. I could use certificate based. But the challenge then becomes, how does the application store that secret or store that certificate in a secure way that it can then authenticate to Azure AD as this security principle and then pass that secret or certificate? Maybe I could use something in the resource that has some encrypted maybe environment variable or something else, but it's really not ideal. But that's certainly an approach we've done in the past. We would use a service principle, via an app registration. So that's what we're used to. Now there are patterns that do solve this. For example, with Kubernetes, it now has native ideas of service accounts that Kubernetes can give out a token to a pod 
And then through OpenID Connect Federation, I could then take my Kubernetes issued token and exchange it with Azure AD for an Azure AD issued token, because now there's an OIDC Federation, it can validate it. And that is one approach to solve that problem of having to store that secret. But for now, let's think about managed identities. So how does managed identity solve this? Well, what I can now think about is on a resource, I can just turn on an identity that Azure is gonna manage. I can basically click a box. I can say, well, what I'm gonna do is turn on now, don't worry about this phrase right now. But I'm going to turn on a system assigned managed identity. Yes, I want that managed identity. As soon as I do that, what's actually happening is in Azure AD, it is now creating a service principle. It's creating a service principle because it's system assigned. It's creating a service principle with the same name as the Azure resource. So this would be called res1, because this resource was called res1. Now, because it's system assigned, these now have a linked lifespan. So this resource is now linked. These are linked. They have a shared life cycle. When I delete the resource, it would delete that service principle as well. There's no secret. There's no certificate I'm having to store or worry about. This is now a security principle in Azure AD that only something running in this resource can get a token for. Because it is a service principle, it can now be given permission to other resources. So this resource too, hey, in its role-based access control, I can now say, well, let's give the resource one service principle that manage identity a permission. Maybe I'll give it reader. More likely, it might be something at a data plane, some kind of data plane, plane permission, so it can actually do things. Now that could be a VM, it could be a serverless function, it could be a web app. There's actually a huge number of Azure services that support this. If we go and look at the documentation, it goes through all the different Azure services that support managed identity. And does it support system assigned or user assigned? Which we're about to get to exactly what that means. But the key point here is look at how many there are. And you'll also notice that word Azure Arc in some of them as well. This isn't just things running in Azure, it's also gonna support Azure Arc. But a crazy number of services can use this managed identity. And when I think about, well, what can actually use it, if the resource supports Azure AD authentication and role-based access control, I will be able to give that managed identity permission to it. So it really is pretty much everything. Now there are two types of managed identity as I've kind of alluded to already. There is the system assigned. The system assigned, I just enable for a resource. So if I think about the types available to me, system assigned. Here I can think the idea is there's the managed identity and there's the resource. And they are linked together one to one. A system assigned managed identity can only be used by one resource, and a resource can only have one system assigned managed identity. The life cycle is shared. If I delete the resource, that system assigned managed identity will be deleted as well. The other type is a user assigned. With a user assigned, I actually create that managed identity as a separate resource. I can actually go in here and I'll say, hey, I'm gonna add 
a user assigned managed identity. I'll just call it user assigned managed identity one. And what I then do is I assign it, as the name suggests, as a user to resources. I'll say, well, this managed identity, I'm going to let you use as well. It's user assigned. I might also have another resource. Hey, I might have resource three down here. That same user assigned managed identity, I'm going to assign to you as well. So when I think about what this means, so resource one has a system assigned and now it can have user assigned MI1. Now this resource could optionally have a system assigned or maybe it only has user assigned MI1 as a managed identity. So the relationship now is a little bit different. Now I can think about this idea that, okay, I have multiple user assigned managed identities so I can have user assigned managed identity one, user assigned managed identity two. And the key thing here is that single managed identity, I can link to multiple resources. I can link it to N resources. And likewise, a resource can actually be linked to multiple user assigned managed identities. So it's end to end. I can have multiple user assigned managed identities. The benefit of the user assigned is, well, with the system assigned, it's a one-to-one. -one. Only that one resource can use it. So it's useful, hey, I have a resource that I need to give permission to certain resources. Great. But now imagine I have a whole set of resources that need the same permissions to a group of resources. I don't want to have 10 system assigned managed identities and have to give the permissions 10 times. It could be a farm of web servers or middle tier servers, whatever that might be. It's much better to create separately so this user assigned managed identity has its own life cycle. I create that user assigned managed identity object. It exists on its own right. It's not tied to any resource. I can then give it permission exactly the same way. I could give it permission to, okay, you have permissions, maybe I'm gonna give you contributor or blob data reader, whatever role I want. But now all of the resources that have been assigned to be allowed to use that user assigned managed identity would now have that permission. So it's far more efficient when I wanna give multiple resources the same sets of permissions. So that's really where I would think about using this. I want to share those resources. Again, I can have both. I can have a system assigned and multiple user assigned managed identities. And then I give it some kind of scope. Let's have a quick look at this. If we go to the portal, firstly, let's look at a user assigned. So if I search for managed identities, now is it showing me I have a user assigned managed identity I've already created. So I've created a managed identity. What I can see from here is, if I look at the properties, I can see all the details about it, it's resource group, subscription. I can see roles I've given it. What I can see from here is I've given it secrets user so I can read some secrets and I can see the exact secret. I have blob data reader on a certain storage account. So I've given it some permissions. So now any resource that's allowed to use this managed identity would have those permissions when it gets tokens as that. Likewise, if I was going to look at a resource, let's just look at my demo VM. If I go and look at identity, well, my system assigned, I just flip it to on and it now has a system assigned managed identity. I can go to the user assigned tab and I can add managed identities to the user assigned to enable for this resource. It's very simple to do. If I looked at a different resource, hey, it's system assigned managed identity is turned on. It doesn't have a user assigned, but if I wanted to, 
hey, I'm gonna give you permission to use this particular user assigned managed identity as well. And then I can give it permissions just like anything else. Now, just to show a point, if I look at Azure Functions, for example, it has exactly the same idea of identity. Once again, I can give it the system assigned, that would be the same name as the resource. I could add user assigns to it. And then those managed identities are just service principles. They are identities in Azure AD that can be given permission to things. A simple way to look at this is storage accounts, for example. If I was to look at my containers, I could pick a certain container, for example. I can look at my access control and I could add a data plane role, but it could be a control plane as well. I'm just gonna add a role assignment. I pick the role I want to add. So I could really pick any of these, it doesn't matter. We'll say storage blob data contributor. And then I pick the members. The key point here is when I'm doing this search, this would be regular users and service principles. For example, if I would typed RBAC, you can see my regular service principle I have over here. But when it's a managed identity, I select managed identity, then I hit select members. And now I say, well, is it a managed identity that system assigned for a certain type of resource? I.e. if it was virtual machines, I click VMs, and then I would see the managed identity for VMs. If it's user assigned, I select user assigned and then select the user assigned managed identity. So it's just really a different option I select when I'm doing the assign to. But the net effect is I'm giving it role assignments. If I scroll down and look over here, notice reader, my user assigned managed identity has the reader permission. If I keep looking down, I can see, hey, look, the managed identity for my VM has storage blob data reader permission. And the user assigned managed identity has blob data owner permission as well. Sorry, blob data reader permission as well. So I've given those managed identities permissions to resources and it really works across anything. Because under the hood, these are just service principles. There's really nothing super special about them. The difference is it's not tied to an app registration. If you remember, a regular service principle is tied to an app registration. A managed identity is not, there is no app registration. A managed identity is not multi-tenant. It only can exist within the realm of the tenant in which it's created. We can see it. If we jump to our code again and take a look, and this code is in the GitHub repo in the description. I, I linked all this code. I did think a little bit fun. I also created a markup version of the code with a little bit of extra description. If you're just curious about it, so you can look at the MD version. Control Shift V will show it in a nice markup mode in VS Code. But I can go and look at all of the service principles and it is a special type. It's a type managed identity. So if I go and do a get for all of the service principles. Well, look, here they all are. I can see, hey, look, there's my user assigned one. There's that function I showed. Oh, and there's my VMs. But I can see all the different managed identities for different resources I have in my subscription. So these are just service principles I have in my environment. Now they are special though. They are, by the very name, managed. Even if I'm a global administrator, I have no permissions on these service principles. I can't do anything to it. It is managed by this resource provider for managed identities. Now you may have noticed it does have an app ID. So if I go and look at these slightly differently, so what I'm gonna do now is let's look at a particular one. So if I scroll down, I'm gonna get a list of the user assigned managed identity and I wanna get it for my demo VM, so a system assigned. So I'm gonna get one user assigned and one system assigned. And I'm now gonna output these. Now I said there is no 
a app registration. But you'll notice, well, John, you're lying because it says app ID. Well, that is just a randomly generated GUID. It's there to stay consistent to the app registration service principle model, but it is completely randomly generated. It does not exist. If I try to get the application for that app ID, it doesn't exist. It is not there. So although it has a value, it is just there to keep consistency with the model. It does not actually exist. So how is this managed? What is happening behind the scenes? Well, behind the scenes, what we have is a managed identity resource provider. And that managed identity resource provider is responsible for the management of all of those managed identities. And what this is really going to be doing when I go and create a managed identity, it is going to do the issue of the cert to the managed identity. So there is a certificate. It is responsible for issuing that cert to the managed identity when it's created. It is also responsible for rolling the cert periodically. So periodically, this will go and roll the certificate that is used to authenticate to that managed identity. So let's see this in action. It's probably easy to understand if we can actually go and see, well, how does this actually work? So what I've got is I'm going to use a virtual machine. Again, virtual machine is just one type of resource that I can use for this. It's a very easy one to demo. But all of those different types of resource I've shown could be used for this. So I'm going to head over to this virtual machine that's running in Azure. Now, first thing I'm going to do is this virtual machine is demo VM. Now, this was the one I actually showed earlier. So if I look at my virtual machines, what we're focusing on here is this VM. And from an identity perspective, I turned on the system assigned and I gave it access to that user assigned. So when we dumped out the code earlier and we looked at those managed identities, these are the two that we're actually dealing with. This VM has access to both of those because it is demo VM, it's the name of the resource, and it's been given access to MI Savile Tech 1. So now I'm inside that virtual machine. I don't have to know any certificate or secret. I'm just going to go and say, hey, I want to connect as my identity. And it's done that. And if you look at the account, what you can see is it's connected as MSI 50342. It has connected through. Let's close off that little comment. At this point, I could go and look at my context as well. Hey, we can see I'm connected through. There's that account again. I can see my tenant ID. Now, if you don't specify an identity when connecting, which is what I did right there, if the resource has a system assigned managed identity, that is the identity it will authenticate as. If it doesn't have a system assigned managed identity and has one user assigned managed identity, it will authenticate as the user assigned managed identity. If it does not have a system assigned but multiple user assigned managed identities, you have to specify which identity you want it to authenticate with. It won't know by default, it will fail. So if it has a system assigned, by default, it's always going to use that. If it only has one user assigned and no system assigned, it will authenticate as that. No system assigned, multiple user assigned, I have to tell it which identity to use. So let's carry on this demonstration. So if we go back over here, what we've got now is well, firstly, I can go and see that user assigned managed identity, sorry, system assigned. I'm going to get the details of my resource. And I've got my principal. And it's showing me there's the principal ID, that 177C83 
whatever that is, that is the identity of my service principal, which once again, that 177, well, it matches the ID we have over here. So for demo VM, it's system assigned was that 177. We can see that is matching through. So, so far, so good. We're seeing what we would expect to see. I now want to actually test, well, can I connect to something? So I'm gonna look at a storage account. Now what I did for this storage account, I showed this before, is I gave that managed identity permission on the data plane. If we jump over one more time super quick, if we look at the storage accounts that I have in this environment, and I go and look at my containers, and I look at images, which is where we're gonna look at, we look at the access control, my role assignments, when we look at the data plane permissions, i.e. storage blob data reader, I gave the managed identity of that VM permission. And that's what we're gonna be leveraging because we're authenticated as that identity. So now if we jump back over again, all I'm gonna do is say, okay, well let's create a storage context using my current connected account. So I'm specifying that. So I don't have to pass an identity. It's gonna use who I'm currently authenticated as. And then what I want to do is I'm gonna try and copy a file. Now currently, if I was to look in my temp area, I have no files. So from here, let's try and copy this file into my temp area. So it says it succeeded. So if I go and look, it worked. So as that managed identity, I was able to access another resource that had role-based access control to that permission. So that proves that idea. Now what's super common, I talked about Key Vault earlier, a very, very common pattern we'll do is, well, I have Key Vault. There are some things that won't support Azure AD based role-based access control. They still have a requirement that I need a secret. I need some signature. I need something else. So what's very common is, hey, okay, I have my Azure Key Vault. I have a secret, and on that secret, I'll give that managed identity the permission to read a secret or interact with it in some way. So now the application inside can actually go and use that secret, and once it has the secret, it can go and connect to some other resource using whatever was in that, maybe that signature, that password, whatever that might be. So let's see that in action. So now I can think about, back over here, I'm gonna try and access a secret in Key Vault. So if we go back to our look over here, this time let's look at our Key Vault first. So if we look at the Key Vaults, and remember with the new role-based access control model for Key Vault, I can give permission at a per secret level. So my access policy, I'm using the new Azure role-based access control model, not the old vault access policy. What that's gonna let me do is add a per secret. So if I look here, secret one, access control, I have given key vault secrets user to demo VM. So I can read that secret. If we look at secret two, Well, I don't have that permission. I have no permissions over there for my demo VM. So if we hop back over then, so let's try and use it. So I'm now gonna try and look at secret one. So you can see over here, I'm looking at secret one in that vault. And we're just gonna try and get the value. Okay, so let's get that secret. And then let's write that out. And it worked. My super secure secret is password. Fantastic. 
Now I'm doing this through the PowerShell. You can absolutely do exactly the same things through RESTful APIs. In fact, it's using that instance metadata service. Here I'm saying, hey, I need a token. And I actually need a token for a particular type of resource. I want a token for a particular vault. I'm gonna go and talk to the vault is my target. So just to show you another method, I'm gonna go and get a token. And then once I have my token, I'm gonna quickly get the content, then I'm gonna extract the token. And now I'm gonna invoke a RESTful call passing the token I got from the instance metadata service. And once again, you can see I could go and get the data. So it's not just like PowerShell that this works for, it's really gonna work for anything that I want to do. Now you'll notice in that example, I was directly talking to the instance metadata service to get the token. And that's actually how this works for a virtual machine. Now, different types of resource use different methods. But if I think about how does this actually work behind the scenes, my application wants a token. My application says to something, boy, I want a token. Well, what it's talking to for a VM is the instance metadata service. And it says, hey, uh, token please. At that point, what happens is the instance metadata service, it talks to the managed identity resource provider, says, hey, I need to go and authenticate to Azure AD for resource one. The managed identity resource provider then passes back the service principal ID for resource one and the cert. Remember that it's the one issuing the cert and it's the one rolling the certs. So it gives it to the instance metadata service. The instance metadata service can now take that service principal ID and the certificate and talk to Azure AD. So it says, hey, here's the service principal, here's the cert, i.e. all of the things I need to authenticate, I want to authenticate, Azure AD will then create me my access token, give it to the instance metadata service, who now has the token and gives it to the application. So that's actually how this is working behind the scenes. It now lets me say, hey, great. So from a VM perspective, I don't have to know anything. I don't have to know my service principal. I don't have to know a certificate. I just say, hey, I need a token. The instance metadata service knows to talk to the managed identity resource provider that will give it the service principal ID and the cert. It will then go and talk to Azure AD to authenticate on behalf of the resource, gets the token and gives it to the application. The application now having an access token, I can now use it to get access to other things. And that's the whole point of this. Let's carry on. This is also the, the system assigned at this point. Let's try another secret. Now let's try and access secret two. So here's secret two, and again, I'm just gonna try and get the plain text. And it fails. I do not have permission. Because remember, the permissions that I set on that key vault gave me permission to secret one, but I didn't give any permissions to secret two. Secret two, and let's look at secret two. What did we do for secret two? Well, we gave permission to the user assigned managed identity. So let's use that instead because my VM has permission. I granted it the ability to use user assigned managed identity one. Remember, yes, I have my system assigned, but I also enabled a user assigned MI Savile Tech one. So let's use that instead. Now inside that resource, what I'm going to do then is well, I need to authenticate as that managed identity instead. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm now gonna connect as a different identity. Now I have to do a few things. I have to get some information about that. So I know the resource group it's in. I know the name of the managed identity. I'm now gonna get the detail of that user assigned managed identity. 
and I can just output that. So there is that user assigned managed identity. So now I'm gonna do that connect AZ account identity, but I'm now gonna pass it the client ID. So that's the bit of information I would need. I would need the client ID of a specific user assigned managed identity. I now need to tell it, well, which managed identity do I want to get an access token for? So now I'm passing it that particular ID. And now if I look at my context, what we now see for my account is it's different. It's now this 6F4DB blah, 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 which if we go back and look at our code, CF4DB blah, 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 we're over there, that kind of random ID. So now I'm using a user assigned managed identity. So let's try and access that secret again. Now I'm gonna try and access secret two. It did an error. And I can see the value. So now we can see that idea that I could actually go, I could look at the secret text two, and it showed me the value, newer secret, because I used a different managed identity. And that was really the key point to how all that is functioning. Now, once again, I'm talking about the VM idea. A VM or VM scale set, something running on those, has an instance metadata service, that 169.254, 169.254. And it goes and talks to the managed identity resource provider, gets the detail and goes and gets the access token and passes it back. But that's just for a virtual machine. Other services do their own thing. If I'm a functional web app, there's an endpoint that I go and talk to. There's, there's different methods, but they're all working in a very similar fashion. There might be a different way to get the token. There are articles about it. So if I jump over here, this is how to use a managed identity for a VM, for example, to get an access token. And it talks through all of the different methods I could do that. Hey, I could use C Sharp, Java, Go, etc. But if you go and search for functions or web apps or anything else, it will show you the code to actually go and get the token. Now, when I talk about tokens, as a user, we always think about, well, I get an access token and I get a refresh token because that access token is short-lived, it's like an hour. And I use the refresh token to go and get a new token. This doesn't apply here. I'm only getting an access token. This is the app only token flow. But it doesn't behave like a regular user. Because I can think about this is a Azure resource in a very controlled managed environment. So managed identity is doing a number of different things here that makes this more resilient. And I covered all of this in my Azure AD resiliency talk I did a few weeks ago. So I would recommend you go and see that. Fundamentally, when I go and get tokens, I'm talking to this evolved STS, secure token service. Now that service, there's different global instances of that. There's the whole idea of certain gateways in front of it. And that's how I go and get tokens. Well, there are also an ESTSR, a regional version of that token service that doesn't have to go via the gateway. That's in every region, but only a very few number of services can use that regional version. The benefit there is I'm no longer worried about the global gateways, the global service. I can go directly to this local regional version. Well, managed identity uses that. Managed identity uses that regional ESTS. Also, this token it gets is long lived. It's a day by default, but what it also does is it proactively refreshes. So my managed identity, my app, when it gets this token, this token is actually a day, but it will proactively refresh. So once it gets to halfway left, let's say 12 hours, it will go and refresh it. It will say, hey, oh, I'm halfway, I, I need a new token. And it will get another token with a 24 hour lifespan. That gives me this great resiliency if there are problems. If I have an hour token and there's an Azure AD issue that lasts two hours, I have a problem. 
if my token always has a minimum of 12 hours of life left because of that proactive refresh halfway through, there'd have to be an Azure AD outage of 12 hours before it would impact me. And that's what managed identity uses. So I get this fantastic resiliency from Azure AD problems, which is why when there have been Azure AD problems, managed identities carry on working for those two reasons. It uses the regional ESTS, that evolved um, security token service, but it has a long lived token that is proactively refreshed. So it always has 12 hours of spare left. That's one of the huge reasons we recommend using a managed identity. It's better from a security perspective. I'm not trying to, as the app store a secret or a certificate, it's easier to use, but it's far more resilient because of that regional ESTS, that long lived token, that proactive refresh. So we already talked about how this works. Hey, it's talking to that managed identity resource provider, other types of service like uh, functions, web apps, they have a REST protocol to talk to an endpoint. Best practices, if it's just a resource needs a set of permissions, then you can use the regular system assigned managed identity. As soon as I get to the pattern where I have multiple resources needing the same sets of permissions, if you think I have a pool of servers all doing the same thing that need the same permissions to other resources, then use a user assigned managed identity. Because now I'm just ass assigning it once. I define those permissions once to the user assigned and then let multiple things use it. Additionally, obviously the user assigned managed identity is a separate life cycle. It's its own object. That may be preferred for some circumstances where, hey, I wanna go and set up those permissions in advance, give it to the resource and the resource can use it straight away as opposed to having to create the resource, turn on the identity, then try and give the identity permissions to things. It may make certain things harder to do in the overall flow. So anything running in Azure of all those different types I mentioned can take advantage of the managed identity. Now we did see in the picture, it works for Azure Arc as well. I think today it's system assigned only. Basically there's a hybrid instance metadata service and other resource providers that push the identities to the on-premises machines. There's still a certificate that has to be managed, protected, but it's now handled by that Arc infrastructure, but it's the same end user experience. So I can use this both in Azure and where I'm leveraging Azure Arc. And that's really it. I mean, we talked about a lot of different things, but the key point here is, if I'm one of those supported resources, the managed identity enables me to just seamlessly have anything running inside it to go and get access tokens that are highly resilient, very easy to use, very secure, to go and get permissions to use other things. If you do have a type of resource you're trying to access that doesn't support Azure AD based RBAC that needs a password or something else, well then you could integrate with Key Vault store that secret or something else in Key Vault, protect the secret or the cert with RBAC tied to the managed identity, and they can go and get the secret and use it for other things. So that was it. Uh, I really hope this was useful. And until next time, as always, take care.